So first, I just have two things I need to announce. Will that be OK? Um, first, uh, there was a cognitive scientist named Francisco Varela, V-A-R-E-L-A. He is actually considered one of the most important cognitive scientists of the 20th century. Now, as it happens, he was also a very, very deep student and practitioner of Tibetan Buddhism, uh, really to its full depth. So that's quite a remarkable coming together of things, isn't it? One of the most brilliant cognitive scientists is as well accepted and one of the most important in the 20th century and someone who became quite familiar with accessing the deep nature of mind. By the way, I've got to recommend a little book of his. So it's by Varela, V-A-R-E-L-A, called Ethical Know-How. Deanne, I'm telling you, you read that, it'll, it'll blow your socks off. Yeah, I mean, you're, you'll love it. You'll love it. <laughs> the little I know you, I know that. <laughs> but so will the rest of you. It's incredible. And it's only 77 pages long. So he, prevents, he presents the emerging understandings in cognitive science in a pretty accessible way. In like the first, I don't know, 65 pages. And then in about 12 or I guess or perhaps 15 pages he explains the very heart of deepest Buddhist understanding in about 12 pages or 15 pages as as well expressed as I've ever seen it anywhere and as complete it's unbelievable and in relation to what he just showed from cognitive science. Anyhow, sorry, it's going on and on. This was supposed to be an announcement. Well, it was, like ethical know-how. Remember that title. Secondly, he, a, a video was made of him talking a little bit about his life and how he met the Dharma just before he died. He was dying and knew it when the video was made. And he explains why he's not afraid of dying. It's a very powerful video. And Rinpoche, Chiganima Rinpoche, asked me to make it a point to uh, make that announcement about that video. Now, the tricky thing is it needs permission to access it. It's on YouTube, I think. So Rinpoche has it on his iPad. Someone gave it to him but we don't have access to it. However, there are smart people around here in the administration of RYI who hopefully can figure that out. So some announcement will be made uh, when they figure that out, how to access that video, okay? Uh, secondly, some of you have been talking to me, sometimes a bit intensely, which is wonderful, with, with great sincerity really trying to dig into this stuff that w that's been erased by what I've been you know, sharing. So I, I, f I, it, I realized that I should mention that I wrote a book a few years ago called Awakening Through Love, Unveiling Your Deepest Goodness. So Awakening Through Love. And as it happens, the RYI library has two copies of it. And then I realized that some of you may want to see it the kinds of questions you've been asking me would you know, be answered in it. So, but that, that book is really written for two target audiences, not all three that I've mentioned I was aiming at in these talks, but oh, I'm sorry, that I aim at in the larger world. The three groups are people in caring roles and professions, one. Then two, Buddhists, especially perhaps modern Buddhists, like 
you guys. I mean, like many of you guys, but some of you are also Christian or Hindu, which is great. And that's the third group, is people from other religious and spiritual traditions who want to learn something very deep from Buddhism at an experiential level, not just interesting intellectual ideas. Is that clear? Those are the three target groups. Now, as I've been speaking this week, my primary target group has been the last two. That is, many of you are Buddhists. Many others of you are um, practicing other faiths. And I spoke in the way I did here with that in mind. This is not how I present in a room of social workers who came to learn something about s more sustainable compassion in their work. I don't go into the, as, as great a depth or into as deep a level as, I've, as I'm doing here. I don't have to get into as much discussion as I did here of nature of mind, of the deep nature of awareness, which is emptiness and clarity and compassionate energy. I don't get into all that. So this is its own target groups, two target groups here. That in the Awakening Through Love book, for those of you who, who seek it out here in the library, you should just connect with Ishvara. He, p he said he, he put it on display and there's a copy kept in reserve so people can look at it in the library. Just connect with Ishvara for it or look it up on your, in your library online catalog. That book was written also for those two target groups, not for primarily for people in caring roles and professions. So its aim is to go very deep from a uh, Nyingma Dzogchen perspective. And the practices were first presented there. And then you'll see on your handout that I've, they've transformed a bit to try to make them more accessible and shorter than what's in that book. So that's called Awakening Through Love. Okay, so those are my two announcements. Oh, there's actually a third announcement, which is just, I think many of you are already aware, but I teach within an organization in the United States called Foundation for Active Compassion, and you see it, the website for it on your handouts on the bottom of each page and on the first page. And there's a group of about 35 other meditation teachers who help me hold this way of practicing and sharing this kind of practice in, throughout the United States. And one of them also, um, also came shortly after I did here to Nepal to experience RYI. She's sitting in on classes and um, she's also a meditation teacher within that my organization. Um, and so her name's Jana and she's sitting in the back there like in the back corner. So I think many of you have met her but just I'm leaving tomorrow at 6 a.m. so John is staying for a few more days, so you may have questions of her. Okay? That's all the announcements. Now I have to find my notes. Don't worry, I'm finding them. <laughs> Last night I growled to illustrate what, how fast a different part of us, a different sense of self can emerge. <laughs> like that, I did that, I did that last night. I won't do that again. <laughs> it's too frightening. <laughs> that she noticed the different sense of self come up with its own pattern of thought, reaction, feeling. Do I have to do it again? Did you notice? Some of you are shaking your head. No, you don't have to do it again. You don't have to do it again. <laughs> well, that's what I mean by different senses of self. Now there's a different one now. With each sense of self, or what I've been calling parts of us, there's a pattern of thought, feeling, reaction. And our minds are almost continually, totally identified with whatever sense of self and its thoughts and feelings are happening now. Totally such that it feels as if it's not just a pattern of thought and feeling, transient pattern of thought and feeling, 
it feels like something that's not transient at all, very substantial. So you've heard about that in your classes here. I'm just trying to point it out from another angle. So in all the, medit in all the meditations we're doing, we're actually becoming newly, more consciously aware of these various senses of self and their patterns of thought and feeling as they're emerging because they tend to emerge in reaction to the very meditations we're doing. So it's fairly easy to begin noticing them. Initially, we're ex we experience that, them as difficulties, which we talked about the other night. Oh, I'm having trouble meditating in this way because uh, my, I'm half, I, I, I feel like I need to think about other things. Even though the meditation is only like five minutes, I can't stop thinking about other things even for five minutes. Don't try to use any reasoning with it. It's a sense of self, a part of us, a kind of way of thinking and feeling that it, most of which emerged in our childhood as strategies of survival. And they won't go away just by wanting them to or by denying them or suppressing them or avoiding them or pretending that that's not the way I am. I'm a good Dharma practitioner. None of that will work. By the way, that last thing was another part, another sense of self. Since whatever meditation we do actually provokes this or that sense of self into emerging, in a sense, in defense against where the meditation is taking us, because these parts of us don't trust where the meditation is taking us, because the meditation is opening access to qualities of warmth, love, acceptance, compassion, right? Care. And as our mind opens to that, this or that part of us, habituated since childhood, will rise up and say, stop. I have to worry about something. I have to reinterpret all this. I have to grieve right now about I'm thinking of a caring moment. So I need to grieve about the person who's no longer here who cared about me. I need to do any one of a million things other than this meditation not because I'm not experiencing qualities of love and compassion and care or acceptance, at least to some degree, not because I can't experience them, but because I am beginning to experience them and a part of me doesn't want to know it. Why? Because I'm sort of summarizing some things that we've been doing this week. Because these parts of us since childhood, these senses of self, do not know. If there's nothing else to get out of this week, this, please get this. These parts of us, these different senses of self, including probably the one that's operating right now in each of our minds that the mind's totally identified with, these parts of us do not know that qualities of warmth, acceptance, care, compassion, our experience of those qualities. They do not know that the experience of these qualities has never been given to us by anyone else. These parts of us think that to experience love, the qualities of love, care, compassion, acceptance, etc., we have to get it from others. We have to get it from outside of us. That is the only way to get them. That's what these parts firmly believe. And as I said the other nights, even though I'm saying this now, and this or that part of oneself is listening and even maybe saying, oh yes, that sounds very reasonable. They do not believe it. They do not. Because we've been habituated since childhood and of course in a, in a traditional cosmology, even in many past lives, whatever your cosmology, whatever your worldview, at least we can acknowledge we've been habituated since earliest childhood before we remember as children for, to survive, to identify with this or that part of us, to get care, to get others to care for us. We had to have that as a baby and an infant and a small child. 
So parts of us emerged and became habits of mind to get qualities of love, care, compassion, acceptance from others, but we've never gotten them from others. How can I say that? Because they've always been qualities of our own awareness. We needed others. We needed a caring figure like, like a, a loving mother. We needed that. Not because a loving mother gave us, g ever gave us those qualities, but because a loving mother by embodying love and holding us in love evokes those qualities from our own awareness. Is that clear? That these parts of us have never known that. You can imagine how that is. From an infant into early childhood, it just looks and feels like mom's just giving me those qualities. I need to be near mom to experience them, so she's giving them to me. That's how it's always looked. And that's what are the, all these parts of us still assume, totally assume it, totally. Therefore, when the, our minds start opening to qualities of love, warmth, compassion, even for a moment, one or another part of us will tend to emerge that wants to do something else that feels a need to do something else. And remember, I, I asked you about that the other night. What difficulties are you experiencing? Name them, please. And every difficulty that was named, and thank you so much for sharing in that way so generously, but every time a difficulty was named, I then rephrased it. So some part of you arose that felt that it had to f grieve over this person that you've lost. So, or some part of you emerged that felt that it just needed to think about other things. Right? Or some part of you emerged that just felt like there's something else you need right now to think about. Those are parts. And the meditation itself evokes those parts and therefore we can seize that as an opportunity if we want to enough. If we don't want to enough, of course our minds will not. They'll just continue to be in the same habitual pattern of being sucked into total identification with whatever, whatever part of us arises. Oh, I just, uh, I need to think about my work. I've got, we're only meditating for six minutes. I need to think about all that I have to do tonight. I've got to do this and then I've got to do that and I've got to do this. So the mind has now identified with the part which has shut us off from the qualities that we've begun to experience. Just shut them off. Is that clear so far? So what do we do? We learn how to not do. What do we do? We learn how to not do. This is in, cons this is in resonance with traditions of Mahamudra and Dzogchen. But we don't have to get into all that in any complicated way at all. It's just the spirit of it, the sense of it. What do we do? Well, if we begin to experience qualities of warmth, acceptance, love, compassion, care, gratitude, whatever it is, you named qualities the other night, openness, sense of safeness, whatever we're experiencing by recalling and re-inhabiting a caring moment or bringing to mind our teacher or bringing to mind a communion of saints or bringing to mind our devotion to God, whatever it is. So you see how I'm including these two target groups, Buddhists and people of other spiritual traditions? And you notice how I'm shooting for something pretty deep now? That people from spiritual traditions might be able to appreciate from within their own worldview. So what do we do? So whatever our access, best access is to becoming receptive to these qualities, re-inhabiting a moment of caring connection, moment that makes you happy to recall, or bringing to mind your spiritual teacher or spiritual field, the Buddha or whatever, Tara, whatever is your best access point so that you actually begin to experience the qualities of being held in love, compassion, wisdom, etc. You're actually experiencing it now. And I bet one or another part of you will emerge and wants to think about other things or do something or manage it or is worried about something. I bet that'll happen for the reason I gave. Because if we, that, the parts of us think if we open to these qualities, we're, we might be in danger because qual these qualities only come from others. So if we open to them, we might be in danger of being rejected by others or they might no longer give it to us or they might decide that we're not lovable enough so they'll stop 
That's how these parts of us understand it. So they'll shut it down. It's, no, it's too dangerous. Don't be that vulnerable. So some part or another will probably emerge, some sense of self and its pattern of thought and feeling. So what to do? We're learning how to not do, which is the most profound way to be with feelings and senses of self and thoughts. What do I mean? It means we found our access point, access. We notice what sense of self and its feelings are coming. That's noticing, accessing qualities, noticing what part of us emerges, comes up, that wants to think about other things. Is that clear? Accessing, noticing, and then the third principle, including. Whatever sense of self, part of us, thoughts, feelings come up, just let them be included in this compassionate space. Let them be included or embraced in these qualities or simply become aware of this sense of self and its feelings. Just simply become aware of it in a deeply accepting way without trying to change it, get rid of it, deny it, without trying to do anything to it. Trusting it to know how to settle and relax when it is provided the space to do so, which we have never before done before, and therefore it, w it didn't have the permission it needed to do that, to find its own way of being here. And then as I've said all week, when that's called unblending, disidentifying. When we let this sense of self and its feelings be held in this compassionate space, or another phrasing, when we become aware of this sense of self and its feelings in a deeply accepting way, what does that mean? Allowing it, allowing it, doing nothing, just being with it in a way that lets it be here fully. Is that clear? Then our mind is now unblended from it, at least to some extent. Our mind is no longer totally identified with it because if our mind was still totally identified with it, we could not be aware of it from beyond it in an accepting way. Do you follow? To be aware of it in an accepting way is not to be it, it's to be accepting it. That means that your mind is no longer, no longer thinks it's it. Is that clear? This is really profound. So it's in continuity with the whole direction of what becomes Mahamudra and Dzogchen, which are the deepest parts of Nyingma and Kagyu Tibetan experience. I know this is a challenging learning, but you have the handout. <laughs> You've had me for a few nights. And then it's just a matter of rereading that handout. And again, those of you who really want a f much fuller background to all this and much more detail of it, then you can, you can look at that book, Awakening Through Love, you know, my book in the library. Right, that's why, so this Shireen was asking, isn't it possible that we're still blended with another part that's conceiving of itself as being accepting of the first part? So what I'm trying to help become possible is what's called in, in uh, lang psych language of psychology, granularity. That's the question you're raising, granularity, which means a great, an increasing ability to notice and distinguish, to notice when the mind is identified with a part, with a sense of self, then if there's any sense of aversion or grasping or clinging or wanting or having any agenda at all, to actually begin to be able to notice that 
And if that's the case, the mind is now identified with a different part, a different sense of self, that's now relating to the first sense of self. Granularity means the ability to notice finer and finer distinctions. And that's what I'm trying to help you with. In greater and greater granularity, the ability to notice distinctions, to notice more finely when the mind is identified with this or that part, to notice parts rather than just be completely identified with them, to notice when the mind's identified with, which is a very frequent thing for many of us, a part of oneself that's trying to be a really good Dharma practitioner and therefore thinks that we are being a really good Dharma practitioner because that part of us is thinking that way. Not actually being aware of that sense of self, but just being identified with that sense of self. This is a subtle thing, I know. But it's that kind of granularity, that ability to notice and distinguish that I'm trying to shoot for. Not only with regard to parts of ourselves, but with regard to feelings associated with them. With regard to how I talked about last night in the extending mode, how when our mind is identified with a part, this or that sense of self, like I said, a, par a sense of oneself that's kind of like managing, controlling things. To notice how our perception of others through the perspective of that part is automatically reductive. Everyone now looks like objects of management and control. So I'm trying, I'm also trying to introduce increasing granularity with regard to how we perceive others through the lens of this or that part. And that's what I was teaching last night. And you'll see that in the handout under meditation number four, extending mode. Really look back, look at that handout. I put all this in it actually. Key points, what are the key points of what we're learning in that extending mode I taught last night? The, one of them is the point I just made. We're also cultivating granularity, the ability to really notice and distinguish with regard to qualities from the fundamental nature of our mind, from our fundamental awareness that we're, that we're accessing in a caring moment or by bringing to mind our refuge field or spiritual field. Noticing with finer distinction the different kinds of qualities. That's why I asked you to name them. All that has, is, granula, is seeking granularity. And it's known in modern psychology now, it's been researched, that someone who has greater granularity with regard to emotions, feelings, and things like that has much greater resilience. Uh, with regard to uh, the Buddhist path, someone with much greater granularity is probably partly why the Abhidharma tradition emerged that distinguishes many kinds of states of mind. From a, the perspective of Buddhism, we need that granularity to realize how caught up our minds have been. Oh, granny, what's that word? Thank you so much. Finally, somebody did it. There is a... <laughs> granularity. G-R-A-N. Like gran. Like in grandma. So G-R-A-N-U-L-A-R-I-T-Y. Granularity. Is that, is that clear? I'm not making fun of you at all. I'm really... Sorry? Yeah, so uh, I'll repeat that. Thank you, yeah. It means the ability to notice and make distinctions in more and more ability to do that at a finer and finer level. Because Shireen was asking, what about if your mind, I'm, I'm rephrasing you, what if your mind becomes identified with another part? And this, this is... <laughs> This is what often happens in spiritual practice or Dharma practice. What if your mind becomes identified with a part that thinks of itself as being very accepting of the first part? Is that a clear, clear to everyone? 
So that's, if there's any, so I'm telling you, what are the signs of that? If there's any agenda, oh, I'm, I'm going to be so accepting of this part, this angry part, or this managing part, or controlling part. I'm going to be so accepting of that, so it will relax and go away, which is typically, in fact, what's going on. Then we can bring, th that can help us get more granularity, more ability to distinguish, to notice. Oh, the mind's caught up in a part because it, any, when the mind's caught up in a part, it has an agenda. And when it's not caught up in a part, it has no agenda. It's not trying to do anything to anything. It's not doing. It's just allowing. It's just deeply allowing to be here. Allowing it to have the space to be here and find its own way of being. So then the mind, then our awareness is no longer fully identified with it because it's allowing it. Well, then what, can, what happens to that part or that sense of self? Well, it, it's, the mind's not fully identified with it, so it, it really doesn't have any way to keep functioning. So it, it will relax and settle. It's impermanent anyway. So the pattern can't keep itself going. But that's what's so tricky. This is why it's great that you raise the question. So I just said all that. I tell you, there will be a part of you that will come up during the practice that's trying to be accepting. But if you really notice, it's trying to be accepting of, what, of this or that sense of self, this or that part, angry, confused, worried, whatever it is. It's trying to be, so it'll go away. So it will go away. A subconscious agenda. And if that's happening, if the mind's identified with a part that has an agenda to get rid of another part, don't like this angry self, don't like this confused self, want it to go away, but not conscious of that, just, I'll, oh, I'm trying, I'm being deeply accepting, I'm being deeply accepting. Go away now, go away now, go away now. I hear that all the time. I was being deeply accepted, but it wouldn't go away. <laughs> I hear that all the time, and that's, that's right there, that's it. So that means the mind was identified with another part, another sense of self that was trying to get the first part to go away. Is that clear? I know it's subtle. I know it's a bit challenging. It's really uh, trying to explore possibility of a very different way of being. But in a sense, why not? I mean, why not explore the possibility of waking up, you know, in a, in a pretty fundamental way? I mean, why not? Well, we would have to want to a lot. And why would we want to? Because you know what? All these parts of us, all these senses of self, they're tired. They're tired of endlessly trying to get these qualities of care, love, compassion, warmth, okayness, at homeness. They're exhausted because they can't get them in all the ways they've been trying because they don't come from others and they don't come from outside. So all these parts of us are exhausted. They're like rats on a wheel. That's endless. It's like the endless, endless, beginningless suffering of samsara. These parts of us are exhausted with it. They are tired of it. And if we can begin to be present to them in a way, present to this or that sense of self and its feelings in a way that's deeply allowing it to be here, not trying to do anything to it, then that sense of self, it's not used to that. It, it can begin to experience these qualities of deep acceptance and warmth and gentle welcoming. It can begin to experience that. And those are the very qualities that that sense of self, whatever it is, has been trying to get arising from our own awareness and then almost automatically if we can learn to practice in that way this or that part of us sense of self relaxes it's finally getting what it was desperately trying to get for us trying so hard to work for us in ways that never work because we can't get those qualities of experience 
from others. We never could, we never did, and we never will. So that's called renunciation. That's a sense in the mind that it simply is too exhausted to continue to go on this way, this way being samsara. And therefore, really wants to be free. And that's a way of defining renunciation. Tired of going on this way. Just exhausted with it. Willing to be free, willing to become free by trying a different way of being than endlessly running around, endlessly reacting, endlessly denying who we are, endless. Wanting to be free of that. We would need to want to enough that we actually try. <laughs> rather than just getting sucked up and again and then inevitably asking the question I was being so accepting why didn't it go away I was doing just what you said why didn't I get why didn't it go away why wasn't I rid of it that's the expression of a part of oneself that wanted to get rid of it in the name of accepting it here I am accepting, I'm accepting it. When will you go away? I'm accepting, I'm accepting you. That's not accepting you. It's not allowing. Is that clear? I know it seems clear, but it's not to any of our parts. And they'll come up. So, But still, the mind is capable of granularity, of noticing, oh, that's a sense of self. Not just, oh, I have to think about other things because I have so much work to do which is a complete identification with that sense of self and its thoughts and feelings. Not that, but that begins to emerge, that sense of self, thinking that way, and the mind notices that that's emerging. You see the difference? And noticing that that's emerging, that sense of self and its feelings, just becomes deeply allowing. You feel the space of that? That's a space that's already here. It was always here. allowing the space that was al always here to welcome that sense of self and its feelings. So that's what we've been doing, building up through the week, and you have it in the handouts. We did meditations one and two and four. Four was last night, extending mode. We did meditation five, letting be, which is deepening mode, which is also the releasing phase of every meditation. That's meditation five. Meditation four, extending mode, is what we did last night. Letting these powers of care, warmth, acceptance extend through us and help us to commune and wish well. See more there than our limiting impression. Just an old guy, just an old woman, just one of those. Oh my gosh. What about the uh, <laughs> How nice. <laughs> so what sense of self is here now <laughs> with its thoughts and feelings? And in what way are we aware of it now? That's meditation six. That's a more immediate and direct, just clicking into it. That's sort of like having maybe done some receptive mode practice that can help us to catch on to the possibility that we could just click into that. That sense of becoming aware of whatever sense of self and its feelings are here now in a deeply allowing way And that's the direction toward, you know, really meeting uh, a high lama like Chigany Rupche from a, a kind of awareness 
that isn't just caught up in our own reactions. Is that sort of clear? Yeah, like that. A little more like he is. You know, just a little even, but that's still a big deal. So tonight, I'll just lead meditation number seven. So tonight, it's Friday night, so it's meditation seven. Sorry, there isn't the time to get into meditations eight, nine, and ten, but meditation seven is a doorway into the rest. And meditation seven is focusing explicitly on conscious compassion per se. So what do I mean by that? Um, first, I have to find out what I mean. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm... I'm not joking. Um, love in both as it's defined in Buddhism and in a way that could be quite harmonious with much of social psychology, love or fundamental care senses beings in their deep worth and wishes them deeply well. So love senses beings or persons in their deep worth and wishes them deeply well, right? That's pretty easy. So what is compassion? Compassion is a form of love. So when we have love or f our basic care for others and we notice that they're suffering and empathize with them in their suffering, then our love, our love that's wishing them well becomes compassion, the compassionate wish for them to be free of the distress and suffering so they can be well, which can then become other forms of action to relieve suffering. Is that clear? So compassion is a form of love. It's just a form of love that's noticing the suffering. It wants beings to be well. That's what love is. It wants someone to be well, happy, flourishing, noticing that they're suffering. It wants them to be free of the suffering so they can be well. You see how close compassion is? How much it's an expression of love. Just wants them to be really well. As well as absolutely possible. Each in their own way. So compassion wants them to be free of suffering and acts in various ways for that to happen. So compassion in its fullest form includes wisdom, which is the larger awareness and openness that's beyond identification with any part of ourselves. You could say the, the larger or full awareness that's beyond identification with any sense of self and can therefore hold all parts of us in healing, liberating powers of love and compassion and openness and discernment, that kind of larger or fuller awareness, which is an expression of pervasive openness or space, clarity and warmth, that full awareness is wisdom. So compassion in the fullest form not only includes wisdom, but it's an expression of wisdom. It's an aspect of wisdom, that kind of wisdom in its deepest form. Now, having said all that, that sounds nice, but there are, are two restrictive tendencies that prevent our compassion from extending much more inclusively and sustainably to others. Two tendencies restrict our compassion, impede it, prevent it from becoming much more sustaining and replenishing and inclusive. What are those two restrictive tendencies that are holding back our innate power of compassion? The first is a tendency to direct love and care and therefore also compassion just to those in our narrow in-group, just to the ones that we think matter. The others don't matter or don't matter nearly as much. Everybody who walks in, I think it's Rinpoche now. <laughs> oh, thank you, Lakshmi. Maybe there, there's, that's true on some level. I mean, Rinpoche means precious, doesn't it? Maybe that's what everyone is. I hadn't noticed. So that's what I mean by a restrictive tendency, not noticing how precious everyone is. 
just a few, the ones who seem to matter. Is that clear? That's the first version. So the meditations we've been doing, including up to the ones we did started to do last night, actually involved there a practice of extending love further and further and wider and wider to include more and more until we're even surprised that we could ever include that person or that being. I won't name the the kind of example. I think I brought him up the other night. Oh my gosh, I could even include him, the president of my country, so-called president. I could even include him, even while having a very strong ability to totally disagree with the way he thinks and all of his policies and still actually be disagreeing with him not only on behalf of others against him but also for him for him so that's this extending mode of love or care which does not erase disagreement but it establishes a very different posture for being able to disagree or challenge or confront not on behalf of others against the one we're confronting, but simultaneously on behalf of the one we're confronting just as much as anyone else. Someone might say, well, that's impossible, but not at all. That's exactly the posture that Gandhi took, Martin Luther King, Thich Nhat Hanh, the Dalai Lama, Chikini Rinpoche, on and on and on. That's exactly their perspective and what they do. Exactly it. So this first restrictive tendency, we're already beginning to address in the meditations up to what we did last night. Is that clear? This fuller and fuller extending. This deeper and deeper sensing that there's more to everyone than our reductive limiting impression is making of them. Oh, just a woman. Oh, just a guy. Oh, just an old guy. Or just one of those people. Or, oh, now my son is coming. Oh, boy, the one who's important has arrived. All the others are pieces of wood. Sorry, but let's be really observant and frank with what's going on here. I mean, not necessarily right here in this room, but you know. You see what I mean? So the extending my practice is actually sensing our way with the help of the loving energy into the mystery of how much more there is to everyone than we've noticed. You know, maybe they're all Rinpoche. Maybe. Actually, they are. Of course they are. Actually, we believe that. But can we actually sense it? That's what we're shooting for. Okay, so the first restricted tendency, restrictive tendency is already being addressed. This is the second restrictive tendency is more subtle, and that's to have compassion for others only when we perceive them undergoing an obvious form of suffering. Otherwise, it wouldn't even occur to us to have compassion because we don't perceive them as suffering in any way unless it's an obvious form like severe illness or intense pain. So, of course, compassion is important then and compassionate action to help relieve the suffering, of course, but a more fully aware compassion doesn't stop just at obvious layers of suffering. It's also conscious of hidden layers in everyone. Hidden layers, not even conscious. Many of them not even conscious to us or not fully conscious that everyone is actually experiencing and we haven't been noticing either because we haven't noticed it in ourselves so we can't notice it in others so how could we empathize with others because we haven't we haven't the basis in our own experience to have even noticed we haven't yet attained the granularity of distinguishing different kinds of suffering many of which have been subconscious in ourselves so we haven't been able to be conscious of, of others in their hidden layers of suffering, their fear of dying, their fear for their loved ones. We haven't been conscious of that because our mind's suppressing the awareness of that fear in ourselves, which is operative in all our behavior. Is that clear so far? So this is the second restrictive tendency, a tendency to have compassion for others only when they're severely ill or dying or something like that not noticing underlying layers of suffering that they're not fully conscious of and we certainly haven't been so we can't notice it in them 
fear, struggles, grief, stress, often not conscious or not fully conscious. So a compassion that becomes aware of those layers of suffering automatically encompasses everyone, everyone we meet or even think of, aware that each being undergoes inner sufferings beyond what is obvious. Is that clear? But how do we attain that kind of awareness, that kind of compassion that is aware of these hidden layers of suffering? There's no way to do that except to be first to become a conscious of underlying feelings of suffering in ourselves that have not been fully conscious to us. There's no other way. I mean, we have to become more conscious of those layers in ourself and then automatically we can begin to notice how that's also in others. In the in how their their eyes are, in how they are, subtle worries and anxieties and stress that we're all caught up in. So much we're not conscious to actually notice it. automatically compassion or care. We're all dying here and we're all terribly afraid of it. To notice that and automatically there's some care, automatically. So the lack of care and compassion for ed anyone, everyone, even the person you're most afraid of or hate is automatic if we become newly conscious of the such layers of suffering in ourself, then we, we see it in others, just in the way they are. So the next meditation provides a way to start to cut through that second impediment to help us begin to become more aware of hidden layers of suffering in ourselves, and automatically we're becoming aware of them in others. So this is meditation seven in your handout and that becoming aware in oneself, becoming uh, empowering, becoming more aware of the, si the similar layers of suffering in others at deeper and deeper levels. That becomes meditation seven to eight then meditation nine becomes generating a very strong will of compassion, a very strong kind of will of compassion for action. But we can't get to this very strong will of compassion for action that becomes kind of more and more indomitable or unstoppable, kind of like Rinpoche or the Dalai Lama or people like that. We can't get to that without going through first an awareness of more of layers of our own suffering that correspond to similar layers in others. So that's what we're going to do now for just a few minutes. A way to become more conscious of our inner layers of suffering. To empower compassion for others with analogous layers. So part of the reason why we've never, why most of us have not been able to do this before, to become aware, for example, of our fear of dying or things like that, fear for our loved ones, which people in every culture have these kinds of feelings in their own ways. The part of the reason we haven't been able to is because, because we did not have a secure enough base of safety, an inner core of safety in ourselves from which we felt safe enough to do that. And that's what we've been building up. Obviously, it's more than just one evening at a time through five days. Over some months of practice, if someone takes up this direction of practice, we're establishing a more and more secure base and ability to access qualities from the deep nature of our mind. So when we feel like we're losing our footing, not only in meditation, but in life, we know how to reconnect with those qualities of warmth, acceptance, love, compassion, inner safety, we know how to reconnect. So that's an inner secure base, or we could call it inner refuge. So clear enough so far? We haven't had enough of that 
so we haven't I'm, I'm just I'm speak I realize I'm speaking on behalf of you but time is short so I'm including myself in that way so we haven't had enough of of that inner core of connection with qualities of the nature of our mind an inner core of security from which we, we can become newly and more consciously aware of our fear of things which I'll give a list of to help you select you can pick one it's like a menu I'm losing my footing but I'll find it I know how to reconnect to my computer documents okay so we need to connect with a suffering feeling that's familiar to us we're going to begin in the receptive mode again and that establishes that can at least establish if we become familiar enough with it but I think many of us can at least to some degree access certainly qualities of love compassion warmth acceptance by re-inhabiting a caring moment as if it's happening now or by bringing to mind our teacher or our uh, spiritual field then right away we be actually begin to experience qualities which we named acceptance warmth care compassion and that can begin to establish a secure enough base an inner sense of refuge enough that we have an, enough of an inner sense of safety to explore one of these kinds of feelings so I'll give you a list you can choose one or it may just evoke your uh, another kind of feeling that's not on the list that's familiar to you kind of like one of these is that clear so please listen and uh, try to pick one of these ready one would be becoming conscious of a feeling of physical pain anywhere does anybody ever feel any physical pain does anybody feel any now if you're lucky enough to have a chronic condition of pain like some of us have then you have a f you have something right now those who do not have a chronic pain painful thing then you're not the lucky ones for this meditation so we need to go further down the list okay for you unlucky ones who do not have chronic pain it could also be just some anxiety you have about your body or your health it could be a feeling of not being seen or included or of being looked down upon it could be a feeling of intense longing incompleteness or addiction it could be a feeling of failure hopelessness or despair I'm hopeless I'm unimprovable it could be a feeling of grief at the loss of a loved one or grief at the loss of anything such as a job a relationship or a way of life it could be a feeling of anxiety over meeting all your obligations or of attaining enough security for yourself or your family it could be a feeling of fear for a loved one in their vulnerability or mortality it could be fears you have over severe illness or accident or violence or injury it could be fears that you may feel at your own impending death so that gives you an idea and yes I think it's I think we do share feelings like that in our own ways in every culture no I don't think there's a culture that it's an exception of that I don't think this is a projection of empathy oh only some of us fear death and the others don't because their culture doesn't fear death no I do not think that's the case it is true though that how people experience these kinds of feelings will be different according to their own culture and location of course that's the case that these are human feelings basically so could you pick one or you get the idea you're basically just picking a feeling that's really difficult for you okay can everybody identify one so I'll give you an example for me what's immediate and easy to connect with because I have children 
is fear for loved ones in their vulnerability and mortality. They don't know yet, when they're young, that they could die at any time. Anything can happen to them. They don't know that. They're not ready to know that. But I know that. I know that when they go out the door. So fear for my loved ones in their vulnerability and mortality is very easy for me to connect with. Also pain, physical pain. Uh, the first one's more, actually more. Okay, so that's just an example. See what it is for you. Okay, can everybody pick something? Okay, so we're going to begin in the receptive mode. This will be very short. Don't worry. Oh, that's right. First, we have to stretch. <laughs> How to do that? How do we do that? Those of us who have chronic pain may really need to stretch in ways that help relieve it a little bit. <coughs> Not that any of us would have anything like that. Thank you. You're modeling for me. You do it better. <laughs> I, did r I did not really know how to do it until I saw you doing it. <laughs> Thank you, Kunzang. So we'll begin with some abdominal breathing. So the tummy is expanding on the inhale. Exhale is relaxed and slow, complete. Pause a little bit at the end of the exhale. And then again, the tummy expands on the inhale. Isn't that relaxing? And now, receptive mode. So your, best, your own best access point to the experience of care, love, compassion of being held in those qualities. So you could recall a caring moment that makes you happy to recall. That's the, the sign of a proper one for this practice. Makes you happy to recall. Just a moment with someone, human or animal, makes you happy to recall. Or you can bring to mind your spiritual teacher or field of refuge or communion of saints. Whatever really brings a felt sense. Now, if it's a caring moment, you, we need to inhabit it as happening now. It's not just a memory in the past. That person or being is with you now in that way, in that place, here. And immediately, if it's a moment that makes you happy to recall, and now you are in it, you are experiencing qualities like warmth, acceptance, and so forth. So relax into the feeling of that, steeping in that loving energy and its qualities. Into your whole body and mind every part of you loved in its very being. Just accepting it, allowing it. Experience the unconditional quality of this deep acceptance. If a part of you comes up, a sense of self that wants to think about other things, let that just be included. Or recall your caring moment or spiritual field. And just let this part or sense of self be included in this compassionate space by deeply allowing it 
just deeply allowing it, not being it, allowing it. And now bring to mind the feeling that you selected from the list or the feeling that's very difficult for you, like for me, the feeling of fear for my children in their vulnerability and mortality. Try to bring that to mind now, whatever your very difficult feeling is. Or fear of dying or fear around safety or any of the others, or physical pain. And just take a little time now to sense what it's like for someone to experience that feeling through your own experience of it. Let yourself feel that, what that's like. that difficult feeling. Try to really feel what it's like for you as an example of many others. So how does it feel in your heart and mind? And how does it feel in the body? And what other feelings come up in association with that feeling? How does the whole world look and feel from within this feeling? Now, many, many other people experience feelings like this in their own ways, this very feeling. So now, sense right through your feeling what many, many others feel. It's no longer just your feeling. Feel right through your feeling what many others feel. This is the kind of feeling they feel. This is what it's like for them. This is what it's like for them. This is what it's like for them. And now recall that your whole being is held in unconditional love, compassion, warmth, acceptance. Your whole being. And let all of your feelings be embraced in this compassionate energy from within your caring moment or spiritual field. All your feelings. This one too. And by accepting this loving energy into your own difficult feelings, imagine that you're accepting it into everyone's analogous feelings, everyone's similar feelings, by letting the radiance of this caring energy extend through you to them all, extend through you to everyone who experiences similar feelings, letting it come through you to them all. wishing them deeply well and free of distress and suffering.
wishing them who experience feelings like this deeply well and free of distress and suffering. Wishing all, wishing all those others who experience feelings like that deeply well and free. And now just relax deeply into whatever this, this felt sense of care or acceptance or compassion or this energy. Just relax deeply into it and let that help your heart and mind to trust, let go of all of its images and frameworks. And just let the mind fall gently, totally open like space. Let the mind reunite with the natural openness that's already here. Beyond all frames of reference, like space. So I'm showing you how to drink it. <laughs> you can drink yours too if you want. It's up to you. So normally our experience of uh, suffering, especially intense suffering, makes us feel terribly isolated from others and alone in our pain. That's normally how we experience our pain. Yes? With this meditation, we're learning to experience our painful feelings, not as isolating us from others, but as connecting us to them. So in this meditation, we're learning that we can experience our painful feelings, not as isolating us from others not as terrible aloneness, but as deeply connecting us to others who undergo similar or analogous kinds of feeling. Like the example I gave about my fear for my children. You all understand that, right? With regard to that kind of fear, with regard to someone in your life perhaps, or at least with regard to yourself. Anything can happen at any moment. There could be an earthquake right now. We all die. You see what I mean? But our conscious mind just doesn't want to know that. Of course. But it has not felt safe enough to know that. What if our conscious mind knows that all the time? knows how terrified at an unconscious level everybody is. Whatever our conscious mind knew that, how would we see everyone? How would everyone look to us? I mean, how would they, how would we perceive them as deeply worthy of care in their vulnerability and mortality and their fear of it. You see how connecting that is? But I can't be aware in that way unless I'm aware of it in myself. Second point is that by sensing hidden layers of suffering <coughs> in all others in that way, layers that have been hidden, not, fu not fully conscious to them. They hadn't been conscious to me before. By becoming newly conscious of these hidden layers of suffering that we all share, each in our own way, in our own location, this practice much further breaks down the in-group, out-group boundaries that have impeded much more inclusive love and compassion. So by, again, by sensing these hidden layers of suffering in everyone, 
first by beginning to access them in ourselves, then this practice much further breaks down the in-group, out-group boundaries that have been impeding our compassion. It just starts to demolish them. Because the primary thing that's worth noticing about anyone is not just their shape, color, age, how they look to me, but what they are going through. What they are going through. You understand what I'm saying? The last point I want to make right now before we close is just that this kind of practice also helps protect us from what I talked about my first evening, what's called empathic distress, repeated empathic distress that becomes emotional depletion because we get caught up in the experience of our own pain from our empathy with others who are in pain. So we're with others or we're thinking of others who are in pain and we get caught up in our own painful empathy for them. And if we keep doing that, and this is a big problem for everyone in all caring professions and roles, if we keep doing that again and again, which we tend to do, repeated emotional uh, empathic distress in that way, it becomes empathic overwhelm, emotional depletion, what's called compassion fatigue. We simply cannot care or empathize anymore with others because it's too painful. That happens to a lot of nurses, doctors, social workers, teachers, therapists, psychiatrists. It happens a lot to us. Empathic overwhelm. This practice is showing us a way to be protected from that or to help heal that by showing how we have the power to host even our most painful feelings in a deeply healing way. a way that's becoming aware of our feelings in a deeply accepting, compassionate way. And that becomes the power to be with others and their feelings in a more healing and compassionate way. But we can't, we can't get to that being that the, the actual ability to be with others who are in pain or suffering, being with them in a way that can be healing and deeply compassionate to them and their feelings, we can't get to that just by believing that's a good way to be. The only way to get to that is by learning how to be present in exactly that way to our own feelings, deep with deep acceptance and care and warmth and compassion. And then from that posture, if we're with anyone else or thinking of anyone else, we are already present to them in that same way, already. Is that clear? So sorry, it, on the one hand, I felt like once I saw you all and we're all together again, I felt like, well, you know, some people here, it's their first time, and even people who have been here all week, this is challenging stuff. It's really subtle. I needed to go back over everything we'd done quickly and then introduce our final meditation and process it. So I'm afraid we've run out of time, but the managing, controlling part of me feels quite pleased because it covered everything that needed to be covered for now. And you have the handout and you know how to access the book that gives more information on all this. So I want to really thank you for your showing up in the way you have, really. The deep sincerity, the deep willingness and commitment, really, to really explore together. I really appreciate that. It was really empowering for me. So thank you all. Thank you.